There are two ideas today that I want to present, one of which is contemplative fitness itself, uh, which is a, a kind of an umbrella concept. And, and secondly, I, I want to give something that you can put in that. Uh, it, was, it was about two years ago that I spoke at the Buddhist Geeks LA conference, and I talked about enlightenment for the rest of us, in which I made the case that enlightenment is for everybody. Uh, it's, it's not just for special people in caves, and that it's a, it's a natural, organic process of human development that's available to, to everyone. So today I'd like to follow up on that idea by presenting a concept that I think we're sorely in need of. Even as the mindfulness revolution seems to be knocking at the door with with uh, mindfulness being taught in schools and, and prisons and the military and uh, the movers and shakers in Silicon Valley are embracing mindfulness, we don't have an overarching concept for the benefits of meditation. There are specialties, and there's, uh, I think there's some confusion about how all these things fit together. So what I propose is that we take the concept of physical fitness and just move it over wholesale into the realm of the benefits of meditation. One way to, to start uh, framing this is to remember that these concepts don't emerge fully formed. They develop over time. For example, when I was a little kid growing up in the 60s, the concept of physical fitness as we know it today, it didn't really exist. There were sports and athletics, but for those of us who were not competitive athletes, there, it wasn't clear how that was relevant to us. We were spectators. But there were some pioneering efforts. There was, for example, Jack LaLanne. <laughs> now, Jack LaLanne had a television show at a time in the 60s when there were only three or four channels that you could actually watch, so you couldn't miss this guy. So here he is. He's, he's, look at him. He's, he's impossibly muscular. He's probably about 80 years old in that picture. Imagine what he looked like earlier. And he, would, he always seemed to be doing jumping jacks. He, was, he would wear his trademark navy blue or black jumpsuit. And, and we would watch him on television. He had this crazy French accent. And he would talk about how important it is to be physically fit. And, and the idea was, apparently, that if you did enough jumping jacks, you could look like him. The U.S. government uh, got into the, the fitness uh, movement as early as the mid-50s. And so by the time I was in junior high school in, in the mid uh, early 70s, uh, they had something called the President's Council on Physical Fitness. And you could earn a badge by doing a certain number of sit-ups and pull-ups and, uh, and being physically fit. Now, looking back on this, when you consider where we are now with, with physical fitness, how sophisticated we are, we can chuckle about how unsophisticated we were then. But it had to start somewhere. So it seems to me that, that now, uh, with the, the way we understand the benefits of meditation, we're pretty much where we were in the 60s with physical fitness. If you consider that uh, now with physical fitness, we can target specific muscle groups and we can, uh, we can have designer bodies and you can train to be a, a ballerina or a, a power lifter, it's remarkable how sophisticated. And, and, I'm, and I think that in the future, we will be that, uh, that good with our contemplative fitness. There are some questions that get a lot easier once you have this schema, once you have this umbrella concept that contemplative fitness refers to everything that could happen uh, with meditation and, and 
rel uh, related practices. So questions, they get easier once you have this concept. For example, do I have to believe anything? Well, if I ask you, do you have to believe anything to be physically fit, you'd probably say, no, you just have to exercise. That's a powerful concept. What you have to believe is that you, if, you do the, if you do the practices, you're going to improve. Notice that, that part of my theme throughout is to normalize and demystify uh, awakening, to uh, demystify meditation and the benefits thereof. It's perfectly reasonable to expect that you can uh, realize tremendous benefits from meditation even if you don't subscribe to any particular belief system except to practice. Another question, how much practice should I do? How good do you want to get? Do you want to look like Jack LaLanne? You better practice. <laughs> but if it's just, what if it's a casual lifestyle thing? You, if you walk three times a week, uh, you're better off than if you don't. Same thing with meditation. Now, this idea of how much practice, it, what it makes me think of is that once we have the understanding of contemplative fitness, we can talk about contemplative excellence. And that's really exciting to me. So if you are the kind of person who wants to uh, take this to Olympic levels of, of excellence, you can do that with, with contemplative fitness. It would be a question of, of uh, priorities and doing it. Which practices should I do? That's a related question. Uh, you should find out what these practices lead to and do the practices that interest you. How about this one? Is it okay to have goals? Is it okay to have goals in physical fitness? Yeah. If you don't, it's unlikely that you're going to, to excel. I would argue that that, uh, that might work for your contemplative fitness as well. And here's one. What does excellence look like? Who is the most... Uh, contemplative fit person around. <laughs> let, me, let me make a, a, a parallel here, again, between physical fitness and contemplative fitness. If I said to you, Michael Jordan was not a great athlete, and the reason I know this is because he doesn't look very much like my favorite athlete, Serena Williams. And in fact, I think she could trash him at tennis. <laughs> you would say, what are you talking about? That's absurd. These are two different a athletes. They're obviously excellent, both of them. They're, they're uh, amazingly fit specimens. And they don't do the same sport. So why are you even doing this? And yet, if I said to you, Ramana Maharshi was not a great yogi, because he doesn't look very much like my favorite yogi. You know, take your pick, but I've got a picture of Gangaji here. People buy into this kind of argument. We still, this is what I mean about how we can become more sophisticated in how we think about this. We can understand that these are both uh, examples of excellence. And we really don't have to go to, my guru can beat up your guru. <laughs> Which of these guys is a better athlete? You've got a, power, you've got a power lifter and you have a marathoner. They might both be wonderful at what they do. And interestingly, if you're optimizing your physical fitness for powerlifting, you probably won't be a very good marathoner and, and vice versa. But I don't really believe that those guys sit around and argue about which one of them is best. Okay, now, armed with this concept, this umbrella concept of contemplative fitness, I'd like to plug something into it by uh, introducing uh, a, an idea that I call ramification. And this is a way to model uh, developmental awakening. If you...
I think, uh, let me just start by, say, by listing some benefits of, of, of meditation, then I'm going to plug them into this model. Some people uh, meditate for stress reduction. Kate Johnson this morning said, yeah, we're all in it for stress reduction and for the health benefits, but we'd like to awaken too. I think that's a very good way to frame it. But, but we can acknowledge that there are lots of things that meditation can do for you. Uh, meditation might give you reliable access to altered states. It might get you a quiet mind. It might get you psychic powers, depending on how you define those things. It might get you a non-dual experience. That's a big one. Uh, it might lead to compassion. Using the model of a tree. Now, this is the, the ramification idea. If you trace the Latin roots of ramification, it means branching. So we're going to use the tree. Now, this particular tree grows right up the middle. So the zone of optimal growth on this tree is, is at the top in the middle. If you were to take a paintbrush and splash a little bit of paint right at the top in the middle, it wouldn't stay there. You can see how it slides off to the side like this and slides further down. This is the ramification. This is the branching. So if you wanted to stay in the zone of optimal development, you couldn't fixate upon one thing. You couldn't fixate, in, in our uh, analogy here, you can't fixate upon calm. You can say, okay, I've got it. Meditation is about calm, so I'm going to do it uh, until I, I'm as calm as, as you can possibly imagine. You actually would presumably become calm, but there's an opportunity cost. You'd be missing on the zone of optimal de development. So you're better off to just iteratively put yourself back into this spot again and again and see what happens. Don't fixate upon calm or, or a quiet mind or even compassion. I mean, these are wonderful things. But to really get the benefit of this, according to the ramification model, uh, you're going to have to uh, keep it fresh. So here we have contemplative fitness as an umbrella concept uh, within which to plug in all of the benefits of meditation and have something to plug into it, which is my, uh, my quick and dirty concept of ramification. The physical fitness revolution took hold when we stopped watching Jack LaLanne doing jumping jacks on TV and did jumping jacks ourselves. The contemplative revolution, which I think we're just on the cusp of, will take hold when, when more people, I'm preaching to the choir here, I think people in this room already make this a priority, but when this is a cultural priority, when there's a president's council on youth contemplative fitness, and when more people as individuals put in the time to develop their contemplative fitness, uh, I think we'll have a revolution. I'm hoping that, that in, within 20 years, contemplative fitness will be as much a part of mainstream culture as physical fitness is today. And I think a great deal of good would come from such a uh, revolution. Thank you.